So uh, let's talk about mitral valve, and uh, we will start with mitral stenosis. So going back to what I told you in class, as, as you remember, if it's a stenosis, it is usually a pressure lesion, okay? Now, the gradient is between the left atrium and the left ventricle. This is where you have to push the blood through to get to the, uh, to the, to the left ventricle. So your preload is, is decreasing because the left atrium has to do a lot of work to open up that mitral valve that's stiff. Um, usually it is rheumatic in etiology. And the left ventricle is protected because the pressure gradient, the, the left atrium is doing all the work. And since the left atrium is, uh, is somewhat of a weaker structure, usually there is blood backing up into the left atrium and then the left atrial pressure is going to go up. So since the left atrium doesn't have a lot of muscle, all of this is going to translate back into the pulmonary va uh, vasculature. So it's pulmonary veins, pulmonary vasculature, pulmonary arterial pressure usually will go up and eventually it can lead to the right ventricular systolic dysfunction. As the left ventricular inflow, uh, and you can translate that into left ventricular filling, as this obstruction becomes severe, the stroke volume drops. Because remember I just showed you on the pressure volume curves what happens when you have decrease in preload. What happens is that your curve, the pressure volume loop shifts to the left and the stroke volume decreases. So your stroke volume drops, your cardiac output will, will decrease. And what people present with usually is dyspnea and exertion, shortness of breath. Because there is high PA pressure, they, they sometimes have hemoptysis because they rupture pulmonary vasculature. They develop atrial fibrillation because the left atrium enlarges and that becomes electrically unstable. And then they can have right ventricular failure symptoms. So anatomically, um, Yes, let's shift this back to the arrow. Uh, anatomically, this is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle, the mitral valve is right here. And then this shows significant obstruction in the mitral valve. The, the cartoon is trying to depict that there is a lot of force that needs to open up that mitral valve. So this is an anatomy of this. In terms of pressures, in terms of pathophysiology, if this guy is normal, so the left atrial pressure is about 10, and the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is about 10, and the left ventricle has to mount pressure of about 120 to open up the aortic valve, what happens when you have mitral valve stenosis? Well, the gradient is between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So the left atrial pressure goes up, the left atrium dilates, and the preload of the left ventricle drops because you can't open that valve. So eventually you're going to get to the point where the left ventricular preload is going to be so low that the stroke volume drops. Well, if the preload is low, what happens to the Frank Starling curve, right? There's not much of the stretch on the myocardium, so that you shift on that curve to the left and your contractility drops. So the pressures in the left ventricle drop as well. So, so those are the hemodynamics of, of patients with mitral stenosis. Now, when we look at pressure of waveforms in the cath lab, if you, uh, let me sh just show you what these are. This is the left ventricular pressure right here. And this is the left atrial pressure right here. Now notice you have a very large gradient between the left atrial pressure and the left ventricular pressure in diastole, okay? All this area right here there is a pressure gradient between the left atrium and the left ventricle in diastole. This is what the left atrium has to overcome to push the blood into the left ventricle. And again, here, this is the cartoony representation. Um, there is a diastolic gradient, okay, between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Now, this guy also has a large V wave, and this is an incidental finding here, but I'm sure this guy has also mitral regurgitation, and we'll talk about it in the next section of this talk. But, but this is what I want you to point, or this is what I want you to pay attention to, is the gradient between the, the left atrium and the left ventricle in diastole. This is what the left atrium has to work to overcome to open up the valve. 
This is the uh, pressure volume loop. So this is normal. This is your stroke volume in a normal pressure volume loop. And this, the red pressure volume loop is what happens in patients with mitral stenosis. It's shifted to the left because the preload is decreased in the left ventricle. Notice also that the stroke volume here is decreased compared to the normal stroke volume that's depicted here. And this is not, the contractility line is unchanged, right? That's not changed. And the diastolic filling line is unchanged. This is, all this happened because you moved the preloads down, you moved the curve down to the left. That's, that's all that, that I'm trying to show you. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit to mitral regurgitation. So regurgitation, as I was telling you, that's a volume lesion, right? So usually it's degenerative and myxomatous. Sometimes it can be due to, uh, to left ventricular dilatation, heart failure, ischemia, endocarditis would destroy the valve. So there's different etiologies for why the mitral valve becomes uh, insufficient and, and leaky. So we have uh, organic and that would be the mitral valve structure is abnormal, so, you know, endocarditis, um, uh, prolapse, et cetera, et cetera, or uh, functional. Functional MR is basically your ischemia or LV cavity dilatation. Now, it's a volume lesion. Where's the volume coming from, where it's going to? Well, the volume is coming from when the left ventricle contracts, the normal output should go into the aorta. Here you have two ways that it can go. It can go into the aorta or it can go into the left atrium because the mitral valve is insufficient. It's incompetent. Where do you think blood wants to go? What did I tell you in class? The blood's going to go where the pressure is less. Where do you think the, the pressure is less? In the left atrium or in the aorta? Obviously it's in the left atrium. Aortic blood pressure is 120. Left atrial blood pressure is 10. Where do you think the, the blood is going to go? Obviously it's going to go back into the left atrium. It's much easier. So you will have a left ventricular to left atrial gradient in terms of blood flow throughout the, the cycle because it'll, it, the mitral valve doesn't close pretty much. And so what you see is that the blood flow into the left atrium, it persists throughout the whole systole. So the left atrium gets overloaded where do you think this blood is going to go? Well, some of it is going to go back into the lungs, but most of it is going to go back into the left ventricle. So the volume lesion is actually going to be visible at the left ventricular level, and the left ventricle is going to remodel. It's going to dilate, and this is how it compensates for the volume. So LV dilates with time. Symptoms, again, shortness of breath, dyspnea and exertion, and as the left ventricle decompensates, people go into heart failure. Um, to bring you uh, a little clinical pictures here, this is a normal mitral valve. This is a mitral valve prolapse, so you can see that it buckles, there's extra tissue here, and it just does not close. What happens as the prolapse gets more severe, some of these cords can rip, which we see here, and now this is called a flail mitral valve leaflet, so more mitral regurgitation because, again, the mitral valve doesn't close here. And this is the functional MR. This is what I, what I was telling you about. If the left ventricle dilates, so the mitral valve just doesn't come together, and we see that in patients with significant heart failure. Okay, so let's talk about volumes here. I did some drawings here. Hopefully it makes sense. Uh, this is the normal valve here, or the normal heart, rather. So end diastolic volume 150 and systolic volume 50. Stroke volume is what? 150 minus 50 equals 100. And because the mitral valve, which is represented by this line between the left ventricle and the left atrium, it's competent, all the 100 cc's of your stroke volume goes out into the aorta. And the ejection fraction, we know it is stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume. And I gave you this calculation here, 100 by 150 is 67%. Perfect. Now, acute MR. So let's say this guy develops endocarditis, uh, the mitral valve's chewed up by the bacteria, and now you have an opening between the left ventricle and the left atrium. Now, in the acute setting, the left ventricle is going to be able to compensate. So it does dilate, but it doesn't dilate a lot. So you go from 150 to 170. Now notice the end systolic volume drops quite significantly. 
down to 30. So the ventricle becomes hyperdynamic to move that volume that it sees because it sees extra volume. Well, how much extra volume does it see? Well, so 170 minus 30 is 140, right? Stroke volume 140. Let's say 50% of it goes forward, 50% of it goes back. So that 70 cc's that goes into the left atrium is going to come back to the left ventricle. And this is that 70 extra cc's of blood that the left ventricle is trying to get rid of. So it's hyperdynamic. Now, left atrial pressure goes up quite significantly. You go from 10 up to 25. That's why people with acute mitral regurgitation get symptoms. They usually get pulmonary edema. Usually these people are, are significantly in distress. They end up intubated, and we have to do things to help them out. But let's look at the um, ejection fraction. So you go from 170 to 30. So the stroke volume is 140. 140 by 170. Ejection fraction went from 67 up to 82. Hyperdynamic, trying to get rid of that extra volume. Okay? So this is acute mitral regurgitation. Now, let's change gears a little bit. Let's talk about chronic mitral regurgitation. And I put in parentheses here, compensated. So what happens here? Well, this is your normal volumes. This is your mitral regurgitation. So this is a regurgitation develops over years, not like over 10 hours, 24 hours, whatever. This can be 10 years, 15 years in the making. So what happens here? The ventricle is dilated, right? And diastolic volume is 240. Why is it dilating? Again, you have extra volume. It has to compensate. The, the, the way the ventricle compensates for volume lesion, it gets bigger. Now, the end systolic volume is about 50. So it's about the same here. So your contractility is, is higher because you're stretching the ventricle. So the ventricle is trying to compensate for that. So 240 minus 50 is uh, 190. Half of it goes forward. Half of it goes back. Notice the left atrial pressure is only 15. Why? Because it took 10 years for this left atrium to accommodate the volume. Didn't happen overnight. And if we do the calculation for the ejection fraction, it's still hyperdynamic, 79%. So we see these people in the office. I mean, I see this all the time. I, I, I see patients with mitral regurgitation, and they come in. They have significant uh, mitral regurgitation. You do their echo, their heart function is still normal, and the, uh, the volume, the left ventricle is dilated. And if you fix them, they actually recover fairly well. Now, this is in, to compare this to decompensated mitral regurgitation, okay? So I gave you on this side of the slide is the chronic MR that's compensated. So you go from 240 down to 50, you have stroke volume of 190, you split it in half. Now what happens when the left ventricle becomes decompensated? So how, how do you get decompensated in a volume lesion? Well, if you stretch the muscle so much that the myocytes, they are not attached anymore, okay? And so you have Basically, you're dropping in contractility. This is becoming pathologic. This is not helping the left ventricle to contract. So the end diastolic volume is 260. It didn't really change much. But look what happened to the end systolic volume. It went from 50 to 140. So there's really very little contractility here. So your stroke volume is 120 cc's, but most of that 120 cc's is going into the left atrium. Now notice here, your pressure is up now because the left atrium cannot compensate for this much volume. And if you calculate the ejection fraction, 120 by 260, now you're at 46%. So you went from 80% down to 46%. That's a problem right there. And so when people with chronic MR become decompensated, they go into heart failure. They, they come with pulmonary edema, they come with leg edema, and, and we have to treat them. So let's look a little bit about uh, at, the, at the pressure curves. So if you look... This is what we see in the cath lab, okay? So the green curve is the left ventricle, the orange curve is the aorta, and the red curve is the left atrial curve. It's, it's the wedge pressure, but essentially it's the left atrium. Notice how tall of a V wave you have right here. Why is this so tall? Well, if you remember from my lecture during the class, the V wave is when the left atrium is filled, but the filling here is exaggerated because you have the left ventricle contributing to filling of the left atrium because of the mitral regurgitation. Notice there is no gradient in diastole between the left atrium and the green curve, the left ventricle. 
And if you look at the cartoony representation that's on this side of the slide, again, there is no diastolic gradient. This is not mitral stenosis. But you have a very tall V wave because this is the filling of the left atrium that is exaggerated by the mitral regurgitation volume that we see because of the incompetence of the mitral valve. If we look at the pressure volume curves, again, you have a very large stroke volume because the, 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 uh, the curve is just stretched out because of the volume. And um, as you continue with this, the contractility drops. And this is that drop in contractility because eventually you get to the point where you can't stretch the ventricle anymore. And this is where your stroke volume drops. You can compare it from this compared to this here, the stroke volume is less. Um, now, you're going to ask me, well, if the stroke, compared to this normal curve, right, the stroke volume here is huge. Why is the per person in trouble? Well, the person is in trouble because where is the stroke volume going? Remember, the left atrium is a much less, the, the pressure system of the left atrium is much less compared to the pressure system in the aorta. So this stroke volume is not going into the aorta. It's not going into the systemic circulation. It's being split between the aorta and the left, and the left atrium. And when you have people on this side of the slide, when their contractility drops, this stroke volume, the split is not even. Most of that stroke volume is going to go into the left atrium because if the contractility drops, it's much easier to pump the blood into the 25 millimeters of mercury system than to pump it into 120 millimeters of mercury system. So, so don't, get, you know, don't get fooled with the stroke volume. That's, that's huge. It doesn't go into the systemic flow. The stroke volume, a lot of it goes into the left atrium. Okay? So just to make sure that people understand that. One more thing that I want to point out. Remember how I said that there is always a flow between the left atrium and the left ventricle, and it doesn't stop? Look at what happens to this line of the isovolumic contraction. Here it's straight. Here, this line of isovolumic contraction is not straight. There is change in volume here because there's opening of the mitral valve. So as the ventricle begins to contract, the volume drops because part of that contract contraction, it's not isovolumic. There is blood flow going into the left atrium, and that's why this line is not straight. Okay? So again, little details about the pressure volume loop. I mean, it, this, it, these curves tell you quite a lot. 